Gaslighting occurs so commonly, most of the time we don't even realize when it's happening. Before we know it, we're embroiled in defending ourselves without realizing that we have, we have been caught in a deception that is really about changing the perception from what was being discussed or what is real to us being the problem. I'm not for sure most gaslighters know that they're gaslighting. <clears throat> I think most of them think that they're defending themselves, that at the moment they feel either under attack or that something's going wrong. And as a, resp as a response to it, they instead of making it about whatever the issue is, which they've personalized, they make the issue you. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I am going live on both Instagram and TikTok at the same time that I'm taping this for YouTube. So it's kind of crazy here between the two platforms, but I'm so thrilled that you've joined me. I'm Dr. Carrie Kermakavoy. I see so many familiar names of people that I know. It's been awesome to get to know you and to be talking to you guys and getting developing a relationship. But So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a clinical mental health specialist. Actually, I'm a psychologist with over 20 years of counseling experience. And these days, I primarily talk about narcissistic abuse, but all sorts of abuse, but because I'm all about healthy relationships. So thank you so much for joining me. And today, I'd like to start out by talking about gaslighting. Do you think that you can recognize when gaslighting is happening? Do you know that when uh, when you bring up something, I was just listening to a seminar on it, and a common example is say that say that somebody doesn't really want to own what they're doing. Maybe they're doing something a little that they shouldn't, a little off. Like maybe they're meeting up with an old friend that uh, used to be a lover of theirs or an ex of theirs. And instead of telling you and you're in a relationship with them, they say to you, oh, I'm going to be out late. Don't wait up for me, but um, um, I'm meeting a friend. They don't tell you the whole full story. They tell you I'm meeting a friend. You find out later that the friend was an ex or an old girlfriend or an old boyfriend. The friend is somebody significant to them. And obviously there's hurt feelings. Why Sorry, did they? could you say that again? <laughs> there's Siri's talking I'm to me. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, Siri's having trouble hearing me. So I'm going to take Siri's off my wrist so that doesn't happen again. But so say that the, you discover that the old friend that they had dinner with that you went to bed uh, and missed the evening instead of take, spending time with them. Instead of that, they, they, that, you find out that it's somebody significant and you, you confront them about this. You met up with so-and-so. Why didn't you tell me that you met up with so-and-so? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sylvia, yes, gas, I'm being gaslit by my own watch, yes. So you, you confront them. Why did, why did you not tell me that you met up with so-and-so? And they say, I didn't tell you because I knew this would be your reaction. So what happens instead of talking about the issue of why did they di lie by omission, they make it you, your reaction, your feelings, they make that the issue instead of what the really the issue is. And so then you end up saying, well, but this is hurtful. And then they say, you always make a big deal about everything. Why do we have to go there? Are you saying I can't see who I want to see? I mean, you guys all know this. This is a very familiar, this is a very familiar experience. What they do is it's called DARVO, which is they slip, they flip the script, script which is exactly love, lovely fervor. You're exactly right. They flip the script, script they flip the script and make you the issue and attack you and take the victim role. When you came in as the injured party, you are actually the victim, and now you're having to defend yourself forever bringing the subject up. What is Darvo? Darvo is deflect, attack, reverse victim, offender. So it's uh, so they deflect originally, and then they, they begin to go on the offense or attack. They reverse the role and become the victim, and make you the offender. That's what DARVO stands for. So how many of you have had this happen? I have a feeling that everybody in the room can raise their hand. I have a feeling all of us have had this happen to us. Do you know what to do when it happens? Are you, do you know how to get out of the situation when it starts to occur? I can tell you the first thing not to do, and that is not to, not to go into a higher higher level of defense and try to protect yourself greater because what happens is that that only if you've noticed it gives it deeper because here this is one of the common problems with people when we're dealing with somebody who's not emotionally very mature we think when we get into an issue that that we're dealing with the issue so let's make it something simple and not about who did you go out to dinner with let's make it let's make it about the garbage did you take out the garbage this week 
That's a simple problem. The answer is, no, I didn't take the garbage out. I forgot. Or, oh, yeah, you know, can we switch roles or tasks because I don't really like dealing with the garbage. I mean, instead of making it about the issue of let's find a better way of dealing with our garbage in the house, that ends up what happens with emotionally immature people is that it becomes about a circular issue that has no closure and it becomes very dramatic. It's all about the drama. There is, there's no closure. You can't solve it because they make... They make you bringing it up as the problem instead of the problem being the problem. One way, the one way to get out of the bind is to go back to the original issue, to ignore the personal attacks. There you go again. Why do you have to make everything such a big deal? You know, whatever the attack is, or I knew you'd be sensitive, or no, that's not how it happened. Whatever the attack is, one way to deal with it is to ignore, ignore that and come back to say, Set your boundaries. What's your boundaries? My boundaries are around, let's use the example of going out with dinner with somebody that's significant. I'd like you to tell me when you know it's going to be hurtful. If you're going to see an old lover or an ex or somebody that you've had a significant relationship, that's something that we've agreed we're going to talk to each other about. Or maybe I'm not understanding the rules to this relationship because I thought that was the groundwork to what we have. Now, they're going to attack you again. That's very common. But if you just stick to that, you stick to the course of that, and you don't get off that, and you don't let it become about you, that's what they're trying to do is make it about you. That's one way to cause this to shut down. But the problem we get into is, at least for me, if you're like me, is that I want to protect my, I want to protect my ego. I don't like being thought of poorly. I don't want problems being seen as a problem. That's very crazy making. Because what happens with these situations is they want you to replace reality, your your real, what's actually happening, and with their interpretation of things, which then ultimately down the road causes you to feel very, very crazy. I love that. Somebody, somebody said, just smile, step back, and walk away. There's no hope. Well, yeah, maybe there is sometimes no hope. There may be this is an indication of such a toxic relationship that you need to really reassess it. I, I definitely, if this was me and it happened today, I would pause a long time to decide whether or not I want to be in this relationship because this is very toxic. But maybe this is a one-off. Maybe this did maybe that maybe the person really blew it and they're feeling tremendous amounts of shame. So I'd have to know the situation. But if you're seeing this kind of a consistent pattern of a way of diminishing your feelings, diminishing your opinions, and really not giving you the space to show up, then I would really, I would seriously reassess this relationship, really seriously reassess, because what's happening is you're not being able to be allowed to be yourself. You can't show up as you and have, and have hold any ground in this relationship. Basically, they get to control the perception, the talking points, everything they're controlling everything so it would be i would have to assess is is that's what happening or as i said this person got caught in a big error and a mistake and they're defending themselves by making it me instead of dealing with the issue that's what i'd want to know so let me pause i'm going to reintroduce myself again and then i want to turn this over to talk about what you would like to talk about today and i'm going to take questions on both instagram and TikTok. But uh, so I'm Dr. Carrie Kermakavoy. I'm a mental health specialist with over 20 years of counseling experience. These days, I primarily promote content around healthy relationships and around things that uh, help us be the healthiest that we can be. So if you'd like to ask me a question, because the interact button in TikTok, and I don't even, I think there's a comment button, but it's always not clear who people are talking to. So the best way to ask me a question is to put a thumbs up in front of your comment or your question. And then I know that you're talking to me. Um, Nikki, you talk about connection. Is there is there okay? Is the connection on TikTok okay? I had problems on the on Thursday. It wasn't a good connection. So I want to make sure you guys are hearing me. I accidentally was on my cell phone service and not on my not on my my uh, Wi-Fi. So I want to make sure it sounds good. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for letting me know. I have a couple I have a couple rules to the room. One is we don't talk about my appearance, we don't talk about politics, and we don't talk about religion. Not because those things are not okay to talk about, but we don't talk about them here because this is about mental health space and we really want this to be a safe space, not a space where it just it divulges into things that are, you know, that we gaslight each other. So we don't want to do that. 
Um, yes, there are some questions that came in over on TikTok, so let's go back and talk about them. And thank you so much for joining me. And while I do that, I want to tell you, I now have subscriptions. So that's this is the true for TikTok. This is not true for Instagram. I have subscriptions. What does that mean? You can sign up to become a subscriber on TikTok. And what's going to happen is what I, I plan to do is I plan to de dedicate one live. Once I have 10 subscribers, uh, I'm going to dedicate a portion or even up to one live to just those subscribers, they get to ask questions of me. Because as you know, it gets really lively in these rooms and it's very, very hard sometimes for you to get your, what you hope to talk about, talked about. So if that's something that's interesting to you, check out becoming a subscriber for extra perks. I'm gonna also be thinking about what else that might include, but um, so I'm new to this. I'm trying to figure out what all this is, but uh, but you can you can now subscribe and follow me and um, become a, you know somebody who sort of, um, gets get special special privileges and VIP. So what do I do? This is what Mrs. T uh, Trevino wants to know. What do I do when my spouse completely checks out of the family when he's mad at me? There are two types of um, there are two types of emotional withdrawal, and this is what, I don't know what type that you're talking about. It could be some of us become very emotionally overwhelmed. And when we become overwhelmed, we're actually, our, our autonomic system goes into fight or flight and we become paralyzed with, uh, with the rage or we could become extremely afraid and fearful. Uh, as a result of that, we then, we don't know what to do. And instead of wanting to go either on the attack or running for high hills, heels, we just go silent and sort of disappear. That's a person trying to re-regulate themselves so that they feel better um, what's, what's bad about that is those individuals, because conflict is so difficult, often don't know how to come back to the conflict and, and have any form of resolution. So they need to learn resol or conflict resolution style. So what I would suggest, if that's the case in your situation, I don't know, I'll talk about stonewalling because there's another more toxic form of it. But the other, the other um, if that's what's happening, is emotional overwhelm, then what I would recommend is that you set up a plan ahead of time that you say to your partner or a friend or whoever this is happening with saying, hey, you know, I know that uh, something happens with you when we get into an, a conflict. It, it seems like you, you disappear and then there's no resolution and it's hurtful. I know you're not meaning to be hurtful, but I miss you and they, we don't ever get to the end of the conversation. Can we agree to set up a plan? The plan is this, next time this happens, why don't you take 30 minutes? We'll even set a timer. And at the end of 30 minutes, let's come back and check in. Now, maybe 30 minutes is not long enough. Maybe you need to say, I need another 30 minutes. But the point is, we are going to circle back and finish this conversation. So that's what I would work on is this agreement. Now, if you can't get the agreement, there may be one of a couple things going on. Maybe this person is really lacks the the skills to know how to deal with emotional context that may require couples therapy or you may have someone who's controlling the narrative and this is the second one the second choice you may have someone who's more toxic and this is the way that they control you and control the the home environment is just simply to check out and they check out by disappearing and that tells everybody this topic is off limits we're not going there ever again that's called stonewalling, and that's that's uh, that. Like I said, it's very manipulative. It's a it's a form of um, it's a form of of intimidation in a way. It's kind of a passive aggressive intimidation. So, yeah. So it depends on what's going on, Mrs. Trevino, whether or not that that's the first situation or the second. What I've noticed, they're, they're all both genders struggle with conflict. It's never easy. Nobody likes it really for most of the time. Yeah, there may be the few people like it, but. But what I've noticed is that um, men are tend to go more on the offense faster and they get really overwhelmed and fearful of their aggression. And so what they do is they shut their aggression down by going silent. They think they're being kind by not coming at you in an intense way. But what they really don't know is that by disappearing, they're, they're also hurting you. So I want to give your spouse the benefit of the doubt and yes, I know this is not the 1950s, but genders are still the genders, and we can't kind of erase some of that, unfortunately. Maybe we want it to get there. Maybe we want a different kind of world. I'm referring to the person saying, why are we talking about, like, this is like we're out of leave it to the beaver. But but unfortunately, there is 
especially in some parts of the world and in some parts of the United States. It's it's a uh, it's it's sometimes we're socialized differently. So I, I'm not for sure what's going on. And uh, anyway, yeah. So let me go back and take another question. That was a great question, and I appreciate that. And I need to make sure I don't miss um, Instagram's questions. How, how do you deal with a family who enables a narcissistic? Oh, let me jump up. There's another one ahead of that. What's the best way to determine? Uh, what's the best way? Oh, now I it lost it. Sorry about that. I got to go way back. Okay, there's a lot of questions coming in on about who's a narcissist. How do we know who's the narcissist in the family? And I found the other question, so I'm going to work down. Uh, how do you deter? Yeah, and we okay. So, so there's a question about how do we know who's the narcissist, and what is it about narcissistic women? How do they vary from narcissistic men? Which is kind of that's a fascinating idea. I've not had that version of a question before. Narcissism, and I know narcissistic women. Man, I know them. I've dealt with them. Um, there, there are a lot of narcissistic women. Just yes, there are more men than women. That that this disorder tends to strike. It's a little more gender biased. It occurs more often in men. I think it, the stats are somewhere between, um, I would say, greater than 50% upward, up to possibly 75% of all narcissists are male. I think part of that is cultural based. Men are allowed to, uh, ha they have more power naturally and they tend to have, carry more weight and, and, and tend to, it just, it's just, you know, unfortunately, the patriarchy in the world allows them to be entitled and have some special privileges. And that's easy to sort of let that become a stereotype and to feel like, you know, yes, it's hard to see it when you're the person who's privileged, but it can become an entitled privilege like I deserve this. And then if you take an extreme form of that, that's awfully narcissistic. But so how do we recognize it in women? It's the same. It just has a female version to it. You're going to see people preoccupied with their appearance. Um, uh, you're going to see people very, you know, it's the same kind of egocentric vanity, uh, uh, insensitivity. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, of, I know the stereotype. I hate the stereotype, but I'm going to use it just because it's a good example. A typical Karen, I wish we never picked a, put, put it to a name because I think it's unfair to everybody named Karen, but somebody just thinks that somebody, everybody needs to hop to and do it their way on their time. So it's, it's just a, the female version of it. Are women narcissistic? Absolutely. Yes, women are narcissistic. It, here's the thing that I find, and I can tell there's an there's a attitude kind of scrolling as I'm scrolling through and looking at the comments. It's, I feel anger today. And I can tell it's among the males in the room or on live on TikTok who are kind of angry. Um, I, I'm not for sure what the anger is about because there is a lot of stereotypes that are applied to women that are not nice or fair. You know, women are, are seen as why are we all traumatized? What's our problem? We also get hit around with uh, we're making a big, we're, a lot of us are borderlines. Yes, that, that disorder, personality disorders with a borderline tends to err in the direction of women more than men. Uh, so, you know, it's very easy to sort of do the stereotypical female, like, oh, there they go again, being hysterical. So both genders get maligned. Both genders get a lot of, a lot of crap. And I, I think it's, it's unfair on both sides, very unfair on both sides. So how do we deal with a family member who's enabling the narcissistic person? So let's think about this for a moment. Why that, why this family dynamic occurs, why families end up, um, catering to the narcissistic persons because they have a relationship with this person and they're trying to keep they trying to keep the relationship as healthy as possible. They're they're realizing that that when this person gets angry, there's a lot of um tension and life goes bad. It's really hurtful. It's scary. It's even scary and abusive. So they, they do a lot, and, and maybe this person has a lot of power, unfortunately, a lot of power. And as a result, they, they really want to not lose what this person brings to the table. Maybe it's they're super supportive. Maybe they offer protection to the family. It could be that they're the, the money earner in the family. But as a result, they have, tend to have a lot of power. So as, as a result, the family tends to, at that point, become their biggest fans, unfortunately. 
their biggest fans. I saw it with my ex. My ex supports his family financially. This is grown up, so these are everybody's grown up in this family. It's not like kids have no choice, and when mom or dad melts down, they just need to find a way to make it work. I've actually seen it with uh, with grown adults where they end up. Um, they'll do this because they're relying on the what the support this person brings and the money this person brings and they don't dare lose it it may be here's another thought by, by the way it may be access to something like access to the grandkids or access to children this person's threatened to cut off access to something that's vitally important because here's here's really the hard part about narcissistic personality disorders they are very good very good at under uh, identifying your most vulnerable spots and they are also they have no qualms of eating using those those tender places regardless of what it is even when you think it's shockingly shouldn't even be on the table that it it goes beyond civility they have no problem no qualms of using those vulnerabilities against you as a way to leverage you that's that's the part i think that throws most of us is that we really think there if you listen to yourself you know that there's kind of a level that you just don't go below. There's a bar of, of respectability that you just don't exceed. And and don't we assume that others will do the same, that they won't they won't violate these sort of unspoken cultural norms. But when you have someone who has a view of the world as if it's at war and it's a win and lose, and not just the Oh, I'm I'm ashamed or people don't like me. They see it sort of like the equivalent of a, of, of a physical death. You know, I think of the Squid Game. You know, there's a at the Squid Game there's a tug of war, the losing team dies. That every point for them is like a hill they're gonna die on. They're willing to do anything to for survival. And that means whatever it is that you think should be off the table, they're willing to go to. That's what that was sh shocked me. I kept thinking, nah, this person wouldn't do that. That's just too low. And I discovered there's there's no low. There can't go low enough. Um, it, it's everything is potentially fodder for them to use against you. And that's that's where I think a lot of us get caught off guard. I actually was talking to somebody and they were getting ready to file for divorce and they said, oh, my partner is really nice. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be easy. We're going to have an easy divorce. We're just going to agree to everything. And I said, no, you're not. Uh, this is this Right now, they don't want to lose you. That's why they're being very, very nice. But the minute that uh, it becomes a, a, about money or assets or resources or whatever, it will get really nasty. And sure enough, it did. It did. It got very, very nasty. All right, so let me go back to another question. Great questions today. Um, we have a lot of activity in our room today. I'm thankful for my mods. Aren't my mods awesome? Thank you so much, guys, for keeping this room safe. I appreciate it so much. So how do you know if you're a narcissist? Because that's another question that people are asking. And how do you know if maybe you are the problem? And by what, the way, what often happens in these relationships is when there is problems, get back to Darvo because that's what we were talking about deflect attack reverse victim offender is it the person who's being who's tends to be the more toxic individual in the relationship will often make you think that you're the toxic toxic person for bringing up issues that that there they say often say there would be no issues but you keep bringing the issues up so the only reason we have problems is because you bring up the problems if you would just stop doing that then we wouldn't have a problem now that's actually not true because these individuals tend to bring a lot of chaos to our life. Uh, they, they tend to be impulsive and create problems. So there's things to talk about, unfortunately. But how do you know if maybe you are the narcissist? Well, there's nine criteria, which you could go look at that for, the, for that in the, um, anywhere. You can Google it and you'll find um, the nine DSM-5, nine criteria. But let's talk about it from another angle because the DSM-5 is, is suggesting an alternative model an alternative way to consider whether or not you have a narcissistic personality disorder or actually any personality disorder. So let's talk about what those, the four ways to know. There's four big areas that you would, and by the way, you won't know them. You're going to see them around you. So it's like looking for your shadow because you are going to think you're, it's you being you. 
And there's another reason why narcissists often don't recognize it because, or any personality disorder, because they're just being themselves. It's not like they caught a flu or have a heart disease. They're just being, they're just showing up and acting normal. They don't realize that what's happening is they have a, they have a sphere of destruction that's going on around them because of their, their deficient personality traits issues. They, they lack the flexibility and adaptability to handle all life situations and relationships. So they don't realize this, this, this lack of skill set is causing problems. They don't always see it. So this is what I would do. You need to look at the, the consequences. Is there a history of this going all the way back? So that's what I would look for. Are you having these problems at work? Are you having these problems with your friends? If you're a guy with guy friends, you're probably not going to see it, but you need to look, are you having problems with you know, uh, with uh, other female, are you having problems with your family? Are you having problems with love relationships? I would look, look for a pattern. And this is the pattern you want to look for. Do your, the people in your life complain that you're not sensitive and that you, that you're very difficult to talk to and bring up issues to that's, that's the area of lacking empathy. You're showing a lack of empathy are you, so is people around you struggling to find you to know how to, to, to feel supported and compassion and to, just to feel like you care about them and see them? Are you hearing complaints about that? Do you struggle with self-focus? Do you get an idea and think this is a great idea and you start to head towards it as a, and it feels wonderful and, and you're so excited about it and then before you know it, you see something else now also. I know I'm defining ADHD I know that. So that's the problem. See, this is what happens is that you, some of these, these diagnoses overlap and you're going to end up, um, you're going to end up seeing that. So just because you're distractible, you have to see, do you have all the rest of the patterns? You have to have all the patterns, not just one of them. So you need to have all four areas a problem. So the first is, are you lacking sensitivity and compassion? The second is, do you struggle with direction and self-direction? Are you really struggling with finding purpose? Does life feel empty, bored, and you just jump from thing to thing? And so you end up maybe having a whole bunch of things that you don't ever finish, or maybe you end up kind of having something you get really passionate about, and then before you know it, you, you lose interest in it and you move to something else. Or maybe you just don't even know how to find something that's interesting at all, but you really struggle with self-direction. That's area two. Area three is your identity. Do you really know who you are and show up as you are, or do you feel like you show up in any situation and become who they want you to be? And now you're not even for sure who you are. Maybe, maybe that... So you're very good at people pleasing. It's not really, you don't think of it as people pleasing, but you're very good at kind of creating the mask, actually. You're just very good at being what people want. But but on the other hand, when it comes to you sitting alone with yourself, that's uncomfortable. You're more comfortable with somebody and being the way that they want you to show up. But you don't feel like that's you, but you're. But it's you. But it, you don't know who you are. So that's the third, is self-image, identity. You're having a problem with your identity. And the last one you're having a problem with is, um, oh, I knew I'd do this. So, oh, intimacy, intimacy. The last one is intimacy. When you are in a relationship, you are fearful that if they really knew who you were, they would not like you and they would probably hurt you. Now, anybody who's got trauma, we all feel that way right now too, but this is a pattern that's always been. So you don't show up in relationships, you hide yourself. And the way that you hide yourself is you use lying or you have multiple relationships going on or you throw yourself into work or but you avoid being present. You avoid being. So once you get somebody to really be all into you, then it starts to get scary and then you start to back out and you start to find a way to hide yourself. Those are the things you're going to want to look for. But as a result of that, I would definitely also look at the nine criteria like entitlement, um, super special looking for pri extra privileges, um, you know, all, all of the other things that you see. But that's how, if you look at those nine criteria, it, each one of those sort of describes one of these four areas. Problems in relationships and intimacy. Problems with self-directions. They really struggle to have a, a, a solid sense of themselves. And then they also really struggle with um, 
with intimacy, empathy, being really emotionally present for people and knowing what somebody else is going through. It has to have all four though, have to have all four. Like I said, other disorders, autism has some of these issues. ADHD has some of these issues. Uh, when you're depressed, you're going to have some of those issues, but you have to have all four for this to qualify. So that's how you would know, but it's hard because because here's why narcissists and most personality disorders can't see it. It takes self-observation. So the way I think of self-observation is like taking something from a map level. The only way for you to know geographically where you are is to get up above at the sky level, look down and say, oh, in the big world, I'm sitting here on North America, on the south side of North America in the center. But when you're in the thick of it and you're looking around, you know, in the midst of it, it's hard to know. You can't see that. You just know, wow, I'm in a cornfield. Or I know I'm somewhere and the sun's here, but I don't, you know, you don't have perspective. We need to get way up above to get perspective. And that's called, in psychological terms, that's called introspection and, or, or self-observation. And it's complex. It's complex because it requires a lot of skills to do that. Like you have to know how to objectify yourself and how to observe yourself and how to be okay with seeing things that make you feel uncomfortable and maybe make you feel ashamed. There's a lot that goes into being self-observing. The problem is, is that it's hard and people with personality disorders tend not to have the skill sets that allow that to work. So that's why it's very hard, very, very hard. It's something they have to learn how to do. And it also means tolerating shame, and that's terribly, terribly uncomfortable. So if you want to ask a question, make sure to put a thumbs up ahead of it, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Um, I also want to let you know Instagram, I'm, I am some reason, my power is not powering my iPad, and I'm losing power, so I'm going to lose you at some point. I don't know when, but I'm going to be here for maybe another 15 minutes before I've got to head out anyway. But So sorry about that. I have to figure out why it's not powering. Um, so I'm going to go back and see the questions. So, uh, oh, I think I found the beginning. And thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the mods doing such a fantastic job with this very, very busy. Um, Candice, oh, you asked a question, Candice, and I missed it. And I know you've got your spouse is coming home or your partner's coming home and you want me to talk about it before he gets here. I'm trying to find it, Candace. I'm sorry that I missed it. Can you put it in again? Oh, and Claudia says, why does he pick pick on me about the apartment when it's perfect? He says it's a mess. Yeah, that's, it is, again, that's a form, that's a literal form of gaslighting is what you're describing. What's the difference between narcissism and OCD? That's a great, that's interesting. Did you know there's a, a, a obsessive compulsive disorder, pers obsessive compulsive personality disorder? And that's actually the most common personality disorders of all of them. Isn't that interesting? How you know you met one who has OCD, OCPD versus OCD. OCD is upsetting. People who have it don't like it, wish that they didn't have it. It's very miserable. But OCPD don't know they have it. It's a personality disorder. And they, how you know that you've met somebody like that is they would say, um, that you would say about them, they're a control freak, that, that everything has to be their way. It's their way or the highway. That's what you would say. And I'm still going back trying to find your question, and I can't. It must be way back there. Can you put it again in again? And it, maybe it's too late. Maybe your partner's come home and you can't talk anymore. Um, but make sure you put a thumbs up in front of it so I can find it. By the way, while I'm doing this, did you, uh, I'm on all platforms. So you can find me on uh, TikTok, Instagram. Instagram, I do posts in addition to videos and reels. I also do posts. And then I'm also on YouTube and I'm soon going to be putting out longer content. I haven't really, I really have. Oh, I found your question. My question, how to get him into therapy. I genuinely love him. Oh, honey, my heart breaks for you. You can't. That's the short answer. I know you're out of time, but you can't. Therapy requires a lot of self-observation and motivation. I've seen people come into therapy who want life to be better, but they lack the motivation to make it better. 
I can talk to them forever. I can explain to them why they're stuck, but unless they have the motivation to do something with it, it won't change. It's like you wishing you were in better fitness and you know you need to go to the gym and do strength and cardio, but unless yourself get yourself to the gym, it's not going to happen. It's not really going to happen. Um, so it, it takes pain. The, what drives change in our lives and all of our lives, here's the secret to why, what makes you different. You have to be in enough misery yourself to, un, to not like the way things are for you to want it to be different. Nobody around you can convince you that it's bad until you don't like the way it feels. And then that's what creates change. Often for those of us in relationships with somebody who's uh, harmful, hurtful, or, or less than ideal is that we've taken on the we've taken on the pain for them we often step in and make it easier so it's not because we don't like what what they're like when they're when they're in pain they're they're mean or they're moody or they disappear on us we don't like that so then we fix it by becoming we just avoiding issues or we make we're nice or we 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 just make it better for them we do the emotional heavy lifting for them but Unfortunately, that then means that there's no motivation on our part because nothing's bothering them. For them, they have it great. You've made their life good. So it means you've got to back up and back out and stop fixing things for him, unfortunately, including trying to get him into therapy. Here's the bigger question that's the harder one, Candace, that none of us like to ask, answer, and I didn't want to answer in the thick of that relationship is, if this is not changing and if this is who I'm in a relationship with, is this good for me and why am I staying? Yes, I know about love. I get it. I loved mine too. But um, I, I realized that my love was asking me to betray myself. That's not good. That's not good. So there's a lot of questions that came in because I mentioned about these four areas and how does things, how do we differentiate maybe ADHD or autism or these other conditions versus narcissism, personality disorder? Um, I don't, I want to say right up front that I am not an expert on ADHD. I'm not. I actually, <laughs> I'm autistic. Here's, here's the, here's the kicker. I'm autistic. And one of the things I'm very sensitive to is loud noises and just busyness. To me, it just, I'm super focused. I get hyper focused pretty easily. And uh, I, so I don't like it. So as a result, I didn't specialize in it because ADHD kids overwhelm me sensory wise. They just, oh. It's too much, too noisy, too chaotic, and my I, I go in way on overload, super on overload. So so I didn't make it a specialty of mine as a practice, so I can't really talk well about it. I, do, I feel like it's outside my realm of competence. Autism is something I'm learning just because I've discovered as a 50-plus-year-old woman that I'm autistic. Isn't that wild? It runs in my family. My sons are all on the spectrum. Um... So I, I'm around it. So I, you know, live, breathe and eat it. So we're kind of a unique family because we're all autistic on the spectrum. My husband, my first husband passed away. So he was the only one of the four or the five of us that was not autistic, which he kept saying, the boys are your boys. And I never knew what he meant. Now I know what he meant. He meant he could see the, us uh, on the spectrum and that he realized he was not on the spectrum. So, um, but autism is, is, is a neurological condition. Actually, I think personality disorders probably at some point we could say is neurodivergent as well because uh, they certainly have different brain imaging than the average person does. But um, what's different about autism is that they just don't, they don't always have problems on all, all of the issues. You know, it's, it's, it's also has other difficulties around language is a problem for a lot of them. There may be uh, communication issues or expressive uh, expressive disorders, like with language or writing. They also often have um, there's a there's a muscular neuromuscular problem with like clumsiness or lack of coordination or, or fine motor control would be the way that you would say it. You may find uh, people with autism are also they struggle to identify social cues, and yes, they also have a problem with intimacy. In, well, I'm I mean to say empathy. They have a problem with empathy. They're not always able to be uh, understand somebody's perspective from another perspective, but um, yeah, it's just different. It's a different disorder. But it's, yes, it does. It can look similar. It can look similar, but it's got a different underlying drive, uh, underlying neurological condition. So I hope that helps. I know people kind of mix them up. And here's the other thing people don't realize. I, I get asked this a lot, and I'm always surprised. You can't have multiple conditions at the same time. You can be autistic and narcissistic 
and have a, uh, and also have bipolar disorder. So you can possibly have you know multiple things going on at the same time. It's not just because one is going on doesn't mean like I w this is I wish it was this way. I wish it was like oh you've got a disorder that means no other possible disorders can happen to you. Just one and you're done. No no that's not the way it works. You could be depressed too. You could have lots of things going on. Yeah. And when am I going live? I go live. I, I try to go live. Today, I said on my schedule on the front that it would be 1230 today. I ran into technical problems. I fought with my camera and my video for over a half an hour and still didn't win, but I figured another workaround. So that was why I was running late today. Um, I try to either go between 1230 to 130 or I go from one to two o'clock, but I try to come on for about an hour and I try to be here around the lunch hour. So that way, and it's always Tuesdays and Thursdays, unless there's something going on. And the way to check is to look for my bio on TikTok. I post it there, what my schedule is going forward so that you know when I'm going to be live. Um... So how do you deal with someone who's in your family? So that, in other words, you can't divorce them. They're in your family who's narcissistic. That's really tough. That's a really tough situation. I would ask myself, what kind of relationship do I have to maintain in order to keep the family relationships in a healthy way to meet my needs, but also to protect myself? I would start to make boundaries. Like if the, it becomes too emotionally intense that you have a plan maybe you and your family have a plan if like this say that you're going let's say that this is Christmas and you're going to go see some in-laws and they are challenging people and your whole family maybe even they pick on your kids maybe something like that happens and uh, so you know this is going to be tricky you could as a family set up a plan like if this starts to happen we're going to move to another room this is how we're going to engage this is what we're not going to say this is what we're going to say or if it gets this bad, then we're just going to opt out and leave. You, you can develop ways of working with them. Here's where we get in trouble and where most of the questions come from. We want to change the person who's difficult. We want them to stop being difficult so that it's easier for us so that just, this just, just doesn't happen. How do we make them reasonable or see sense so things get better? You have no control over that. And chances are they're not going to be reasonable or have any sense about it, unfortunately. So it becomes on, on us about what we're going to do to set the limits around ourselves in order to protect ourselves. I really wish it worked the other way. This is the way I wish the world worked, and it doesn't. I wish that people... I wish that people cared enough about the end result of the relationship that they're willing to make compromises for the relationship to work. That's my perfect world. It doesn't work that way. First of all, people are like, I don't owe that to you and that's not good for me. Okay, yeah, I hear that. But when you get into someone even more toxic, they feel like they actually see that as a threat. There's that to them is losing and not being right. And and as I know as much as that seems like a nebulous or an abstract, abstract con nebulous or abstract concept to them, that is devastation. That is lost. It's back to that squid game, dying on the, the tug of war game. So they're not going to give in to you on those things. That means then our only recourse is what we're going to do in order to protect ourselves so that we don't get injured by this person. Yeah. So a lot of the questions I get is, how do I make someone be different? No, you can't make somebody be different. All you can do is decide what you're going to do for them. Yeah. And Brittany's right. Thank you so much, Brittany, for bringing it up. If you want to join a premium private group, it's private. That's I'm emphasizing that for a lot of us are in relationships where we feel like we just don't have any space to be ourselves and say what's going on. It's not like you, when I was in the middle of that toxic relationship, it's not like I get on a phone call because he listened in on my phone call. I had no, I literally had no privacy. But if you want this, this space, you can go, in, go to this um, group called Vibly. And it is an app. It's an app. And inside of it, it's the Toxic Free Relationship Club. There's a link in my bio that will take you there. And I actually offer a coupon code of $3 off for the first three months. It's wonderful. It's a small group. They're so honest and very vulnerable. We're sharing real live problems that are happening. So it's amazing. And I forgot to mention, guys. So one of the things we've been talking about today has been 
the confusion that you feel like why do we get stuck and why do we work hard and how come never anything never changes and what should I do about that whether or not you realize that you're talking about cognitive dissonance that's the name for it name for what you're experiencing I know it really doesn't matter so who cares what the name of it is but there is actually a name for it we're going to be talking to somebody I consider an expert in this her name is Dr. Kristen Milstead I'm interviewing her as well as Lisa Sony Manjeet Rupai, <clears throat> Lindsay Goodman, and Bree Peterson are going to be interviewing her next week, Thursday night, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can get the tickets in my bio. This is going to be packed of information. So if you're, how do you know that this would be good for you? Are you feeling like you don't know what to do next and you don't know why you just emotionally can't detach, but you're so invested in this relationship, but you know it's bad for you? That's, that is a webinar for you. Or are you out of the relationship? <clears throat> Excuse me. You're out of the relationship, but you find yourself can't get over what ha what happened. It makes no sense. You're being driven nuts about the confusion about how it happened, how it could happen to you. What does that say about you? And you feel really bad about yourself. This is a webinar for you. She's going to talk about it. We're going to talk about that. Or are you in this relationship and you don't even know if you should leave or how to leave and how to leave safely or how to get ready to emotionally leave? We're going to be talking about that in this webinar. It is going to be an amazing evening. So she wrote the book called Why Can't I Just Leave? Waking Up and Walking Out of a Pathological Love Relationship. Here's the book. She wrote this book. It happened to her. She's a narcissistic abuse survivor. She's a sociologist, a PhD, who has, who's also a researcher. And in the book, she synthesizes all the various theories across various um, big areas like cult programming and uh, sociology's look into problem solving. She looks into uh, the difficulties we have holding on to our boundaries, so psychology. She integrates all these big areas and gives the answers to why these relationships are so emotionally confusing and why we feel paralyzed and unable to make a decision. That's what's going to be discovered or discussed in the webinar. So this is not an intro. Uh, this is not of what is a trauma bond. Yes, we're going to define it, but we're going to go deep into what is it, how to break it, how to get out, how to get this person out of your head. So if any of that sounds remotely like, yeah, I really want to know more about it, then this is an expert. We're going to be actually interviewing this expert on these topics. I hope to see you there. It's going to be an amazing night. I will sell the replays when it's done, uh, but I'm going to sell it for more money than I for five dollars more. So if you want to save five dollars, even if you can't come, buy a ticket now, and then you will get a free replay after the event is over. I'll email it to you so that you have that to watch as many times as you need. And I'm super, super stoked. Um, I I love when we learn more. And I really love being able to talk to other experts about what happens and why these things happen. Because here's, you want it, the biggest thing they're finding that helps you emotionally heal is information. Information. Psychoeducation is a massive, uh, big step in your healing is to, to understand exactly what happened and why it happened. and what Because that gives you power over it. Then you can put it to words, and then you have the ability to manipulate and change it once you understand it. So that's what this evening's about, is to help you put words to what's happening, understand how your brain, your desire for survival is working against you, so that you can be able to do something different. All right, we're coming up at 2 o'clock. I'm going to be jumping over to YouTube for a replay of last week's TikTok Live. So if you want to watch more content like this and see what he talked about on Thursday, I hope to see you over at YouTube. The handle is the same, Carrie McAvoy, PhD. Please make sure to get your tickets to the webinar. I have a podcast. It's Tuesday, or Monday mornings and Thursday mornings. It drops new episodes called Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. Also, lots of educational content there. This week, the podcast just dropped about yesterday. Are we demonizing uh, narcissists and is that hurtful to all narcissists? So if you want to listen into more about my thoughts on that, you can see that. Oh, oh and Unicorn Puzzle just uh, subscribed. So thank you for subscribing. We get, we get 10 subscribers. I'm going to take your questions only on TikTok Live for at least one of the lives. All right, guys. I will see you on Thursday at lunchtime. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.